Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Good morning, church family. I'm Russ Nemick, one of the elders here at Bethany Community Church, and I'm so glad that you can join us here on this last day of February. I thank God for each and every one of you. I'm sure that God has you right here, right now, for a reason. I pray that you feel his presence today. So as we prepare our hearts to receive his word, let us now worship him with music. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason. Light of the 
could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such countless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has and welcome to Bethany Community Church. Uh, we're so grateful that you're here with us this morning and if this is your first time with us, please let us know in the chat so we can connect with you. As a reminder, Pastor Nate is leading a Bible study every Wednesday night uh, and it goes from 7 to 8.30 on Zoom. Uh, this is just a really great time to help us learn how to dive deeper into God's Word and fully equip us uh, with the Bible. Uh, so if you're interested in joining us, you can go on our website under the virtual meetings tab. Um, and again, that's Wednesdays at 7 to 8.30 uh, and interpreting services will be provided. We would love to have you join us. Now this is the time in our service where we offer our tithes and offerings to God. 
Um, so if you would like to financially support us and so into this ministry, you can find information on how to do so on our website and our, our app. So yeah, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for this week. Um, I thank you for the sunshine and the warmth and the early beginnings of spring amidst all the cold in the winter. Um, yeah, I pray that you bless these monies that are coming uh, through the tithes and the offerings. And I pray that you equip us uh, to really just further your kingdom and to help those who need it the most, Lord. Um, yeah, I thank you again uh, for just bringing us back together this week. Um, and I pray that you bless and keep us in the week ahead. Amen. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, when I doubted, Lord, remind me, I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. And you make all things work together for my future.
You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. And when I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. And I know nothing has been wasted. No failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. Hey, well, it's time for the word. I'm so glad that you're here with us. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, I'm Pastor Nate, and I'm grateful for your presence. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to come before your presence. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for your son who died on the cross for us. I ask now that you might be in the midst of our presence, wherever we are, listening, viewing, um, or replaying this message. I pray that as we end this series, that you may get the glory from us applying your word. So now, Father, stir our hearts toward you. Let us receive what your word has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to Romans chapter 15. We're going to be picking up um, in verse 1 and going over to verse 9. Again, that's Romans chapter 15. And we're going through verses 1 through 9. The Bible reads, we who struggle have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for your instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in, har in such harmony with one another in accord with, Jesus, with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that the Christ, that I tell you that Christ came, became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. I want to talk in this passage from a title, For You I Will. For You I Will. When I was growing up, um, there's this movie that came out, and I believe they're about to make a remake of it called Space Jam. And Space Jam, when it came out, um, it, it starred this group of what they call Mon Stars. They were these little itty bitty monsters who had came and stolen the talent of various NBA players at the time. In response, Bugs Bunny and the Looney Tunes came and they snatched Michael Jordan and dropped him into their world. And thus this battle whereby he was trying to help them win not only their freedom, but also the talent back for his peers. Um, but they were trying to take his talent and enslave him. Why is that relevant? In the midst of that movie, there was a soundtrack that was produced and one of the songs was called For You, I Will. The word said, I will cross the ocean for you. I'll go and bring you the moon. I'll be your hero, your strength, anything you need. That basic sentiment said that for someone other than the person who is singing the lyric, I'm willing to go above and beyond on your behalf. When we come here to Romans chapter 15, we see that same sentiment being encouraged and exhorted into this community of unbelievers, Jew and Gentile. In fact, you see at the end of it, Paul makes very clear in that last statement of his in this verse that we just read that Christ died for both the Jew and the Gentile, something that we have seen 
throughout the book of Romans. But here I want to point to that um, because we've jumped off of the last message where we talked about our transformation into his likeness. And when Paul goes from there, he kind of shifts gears and he deals with a number of topics, one of them being submission to authority, recognizing that the community that he's dealing with used to have, or at least the Jewish descendants, had a um, a separated out authority structure that they follow, but now there is expanded because the community is in Christ and subject to various rule. And he breaks that down to try to um, give them some information about how they should handle themselves um, up to and including in taxes and things of that nature. Then he transitions and tells them, but you are to pay what you owe, whether it be respect or whether it be taxes or whatever it is. Owe no man anything but love. And if you flip that around, what he's saying is that you have an obligation to love your neighbor. He comes from that and he talks about the passing of judgment one to another. And in context, what he's talking about is there are some amongst the Jewish believers who are arguing that there are certain things that can and cannot be eaten um, based on the fact that you are or are not a believer, uh, a follower of Yahweh. And he's saying that Jesus has died and washed away or fulfilled the law. There are certain things that um, because the Lord has made them clean, they are now clean, even though at one time they were restricted. And now what you have is the, the, the convergence of the new believers who believe that they give thanks to the Lord for whatever they're about to eat. And you have the Jewish descendants who are, oh, some of them believe that even though Jesus came and even though these things may be permissible, um, because of some of that, that no, for them, it's still not. And they actually are taking offense when others who claim to be believers take part. So he encouraged them not that. And then he transitions and says, not only do you not judge on one side, but then he turns. So he, he deals with the, the side of the, the mirror that says, don't judge them because they don't um, find this to be a problem. Don't judge the person who doesn't agree with you in this regard. Specifically, in this case, he's talking about these um, food eating practices. But then he transitions to um, don't cause your brother to stumble, brother or sister in this case. And what he's saying is if you don't have a problem with, with what is, is here because you believe that it's permissible under the law, you believe that it's permissible according to the faith, then don't do it knowing that it causes a hindrance or a stumbling block for your brother. He says this in um, chapter 14. He says, not only don't pass judgment, but don't put a stumbling block there. And, and what does that mean? If, if you know that you um, have something that is not a stumbling block for you, but to your neighbor or to your brother or sister in Christ, it becomes a stumbling block for them. Don't do it simply because you can. Think about their well-being in the process and in, and in the midst of that, forego it for their benefit. And then he transitions out of that and he lands here where he's dealing with um, this exact same thing being exemplified in Christ. He, he goes here, and this is where I want to take us, because I believe that it embodies the greater sense of these previous chapters that we shouldn't just simply seek out to judge someone else because they don't quite haven't gotten past a struggle that you may have once had or may have never had, but that you go beyond for someone other than yourself. And that comes lockstep with us being transformed into the likeness of Christ because here now we're going to see the example and I want to bring us here because the reality is the more that we become like Christ the more we seek to take care or or meet the needs of others even above our own it's here where we see that in um in these first couple of verses and if you're taking note right here in verse one write this down that we ought to bear um with one another we're to bear with one another. What do I mean by that? When I when we read this text, um, just the first verse, it says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So let's talk about that because typically when you see that, you start to think to yourself, so we who are strong have, an, have a the need, we have the obligation to bear or to carry the burden of someone who is less strong seems to be the opposition there. But the reality of it is there are some things to note. 
You see, when we first began this series, we, we landed in the earlier chapters of this letter or the earlier um, writings of this letter if there were no chapters. And what you find is that Paul once before has said he's obligated to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He, and I told you that we should feel an obligation to share the gospel with others. Here again, he talks about this obligation, and it's important that we understand the sense of it. You see, Paul is cutting in two ways here. On one side, Paul um, refers to the groups as strong and weak. But it's important that we understand what he means by strong and weak. You see, when Paul is referring to the strong ones among this group, he's referring to those who have decided that their faith in Jesus is enough and they don't have to be restricted by these dietary laws. They're not going to bind them up these dietary laws. They can bless their food, thank God for it, and eat whatever it may be. What is he talking about? These cultural distinctions. They're not allowing the, these burdens to be placed on them and therefore he views them as strong and then we have what he refers to as the weak is really talking about those who are still holding on to the Torah not realizing the full redemptive power of what Jesus did especially in the case of in context this dietary issue that is going on between this Jewish population and this Gentile population of the same church what you have is the cultural dynamics within the cultural dynamic. You have one church with various cultures trying to come together, but bickering over things that were indigenous to their specific cultures. And he is saying the one who is able to submit in Christ, recognizing that what Christ has called clean is simply clean without the preconceived notions of the past is who he sees as a stronger. But those who are holding on to the law and then trying to subject others to the law in that regard... Um, he views as the weaker in this regard. And again, in context, he's talking about these dietary restrictions. But when he does it, he talks about us having this obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Those of us who have put our complete trust in Jesus and therefore are feeling free and in that um, feel free to do what we are doing. He says that we are to bear with those who aren't as free of their own making. And I want to point to this because there's some things that may help you understand that a little bit better. You see, this obligation means that we're bound by it. So he says, you're bound to do this. It's not it's something, again, like he referred to the gospel. He was obligated to share the gospel. And in the same way he was obligated there, he feels obligated here to exercise in a manner that cares for the needs of someone other than himself. And in doing so, he says that we're obligated to bear and, and to bear with here is the sense of to endure, to endure something that may be difficult, meaning it may not be easy for you to give up something for the sake of someone else. But for their sake, you are ob obligated and therefore willing to sacrifice it so that they might be um, better off. And in doing that, he, he goes into this and he talks about their Failings, and I told you what that is because he views it as a flaw that they have failed to fully trust in Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection in the, in the way that it wipes out this um, dietary restriction. But he then goes on and even in doing that, he says that we should not please ourselves or we should not seek to look out for our own um, doing. But instead, what we're called to do is to make sure that we care for the needs of another. You remember when I told you about that hindrance issue? Let me give you an example of what that may look like. You see, um, in my family, we grew up playing cards. So I grew up playing spades. So much so that at almost any gathering, you had the grown adult table for spades, and then you had the kiddie table. And when you got to play at the adult table, you knew you had arrived and knew had the skills to not only play your hand, but to bid your hand and to play with a partner in a way that allowed you to win um, more often than you lost because otherwise they would kick you out of the big kid table or the adult table and send you back to the little children's table because you didn't know how to play well enough. Now, that is something that's just normative in, in how I grew up. However, if someone, one of my brothers or sisters in Christ were coming to my home and they had a gambling problem, maybe that's not the day we're going to play spades because we want to make sure that we don't put a hindrance into 
in the path of someone who has had a struggle in a certain way. What I mean when I bring it into the text is I might be good and fine and it's per perfectly permissible for me to play cards, but it's not to their benefit to do so if they have a struggle there. And therefore, while it may be pleasing to me and everyone in my house to whip out the cards and play some spades, we might need to play dominoes today. Or we might need to play something that isn't going to put a weight in front of our brother or our sister um, for our own benefit. And in doing so, we are bearing with them. We are enduring with them because we are one with them. But that's not the only thing that we see here. Not only are we called to bear with one another, but in verses five through seven, we're also called to, um, I'm, not, I'm sorry, two through four, we're called to build one another. So we're called to bear with one another, but we're also called to build with one another. And, and how does that correlate? We're not meant to see our brother or sister as a burden. We, we're to bear with the burdens that they bear, but we need to see them as family. And in doing so, we also seek to build them up. In verse two, the Bible says, let each of us please his neighbor. The same word that was used in the first, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for your instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Notice how that's so externally focused in how we handle things. But at the end of it, it's we who end up benefiting from it. And so in me giving of myself, we, the body, benefit more for my sacrificial behavior. But I want to point out some things in there because it's, it's rich with some stuff. Paul here says that instead of ignoring the issue that may that your, your brother or your sister may be struggling with, we're going to seek to do what's necessary to benefit and then build them up. It says, let us please the neighbor. Let us um, seek to edify, to build up and, and, and insert given words there. Them. The Bible says him. For Christ did not please, again, himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. What is it saying there? Christ could have easily stayed in glory. It would have been pleasing not to have to become man for our sake. Christ could have easily decided he wasn't going to go to the cross. But instead he went to the cross. What is the model? The model is that he poured out himself for you and I, even though in of himself, he had no need for it outside of the desire to get you forgiven and me forgiven for the sins that we fall subject to, for the sins of humanity, and to reconnect us with the Father. In doing so, he sacrificed, he bore our iniquities and, and our stain so that we might be built up and reconnected with our Father. <clears throat> But in this, it's calling us, just like it called this community, to give up the right to do what we want for the good of someone else so that they might be built up. You see, here it says, clear as day at the end of verse one, to not please ourselves, but that we're going to please them for two reasons. For, I'm going to say their good, um, his or her good, man, my sister or my brothers, for their good, or and and to build them up. So I am not only going to forego something that I may be perfectly okay doing. It may not be a sin, but because you may have a struggle, I am willing to give up what I think is okay so that you would be okay. And so that you might be edified, that you might be built up, realizing that I care more about you than about something that might be a treat to me, that I care more about you than something that just might be pleasing to me. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Um, every so often, um, I'm sure you know someone who might go on a diet. They restrict what they're eating in order to reach a common goal. Now, if you know that they're restricting their diet from sugars, would you sit down at a table with them and grab the biggest bowl of cookie dough ice cream? I like cookie dough ice cream or whatever your favorite ice cream is when they're not trying to eat sugar and sit it in front of you and just grab the spoon and start eating it because it's permissible to you and it's enjoyable to you. Or would you consider that this might just impact them in a way that is more detrimental to them than it will ever be to you? 
You see, if you care for that brother or your sister, then in that moment, you have to consider, is this worth their detriment? Is this worth the burden that may be um, now placed on them? Because while they may have some will, sometimes they may give in and start to eat with you. But now they've gone against the goal that they set. They've gone against the thing that they believe they need to do for their own health. Or maybe they turn it away, but now they're struggling trying to resist the urge to enjoy the thing you're enjoying. And the question becomes, as a believer, are you willing to sacrifice a preference you have so that someone else might be edified? And Paul here points that out, and he goes deeper. He takes it a, a, a much further way in that when he reflects it and, and models it next to Christ. Because here we see the quote here that the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me, fell on Christ. And it's funny because you see that in English and you're like, oh, they use the exact same word. They didn't. Paul here uses the same root word, but he uses two different versions of it to convey the fuller sense. And what he's saying is that the insults and the rude com um, comments and all the stuff that I went through those are the reproaches. Um, those comments of those who, and then the next word is, criticize you, fell on me. The rude statements and the spitting and the slurs and all of that, that, was, that really rightfully would have been aimed at you, fell on me. I went to the cross because you were a sinner. I went to the cross and this is Christ. I went to the cross because you had fallen away. I went to the cross because you were an adulterer or a murderer or a fornicator or name any other listing of a type of sin or simple state in scripture and apply whichever one applies to you or me and understand that while it rightfully fell on us because of what we did. Christ said the reproach, the rudeness, the criticism, the slander that was applied to me could have been applied to you, but I took it on me for you so that you might be built up, so that you might be reconnected, so that Nate might be built up, so that Nate might be reconnected. Christ took on the reproach that was meant for me on, and he did it on my behalf, even though he didn't need to do it for himself. And the reality is that in the same way, if we're going to follow his example, um, we're going to need to be willing to do for another for their benefit alone. Jesus says that it, it was endowed upon me. It, it fell on me. It was endowed on him. The qualities of all of the mess that we had fell on him. And in the same way, we're called to follow his example in order that we might build one another. But that's not the only thing. Not only are we meant to bear um, with one another, we're meant to build one another. And after we learn to bear with one another and build one another, we are to be welcoming to one another. We are to be welcoming to one another. Let's take a look at verses five through seven. And the Bible says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Understand that in the context here, we have these merging um, communities trying to be one with each other. And Paul is exhorting them to welcome one another in the same way that Christ welcomed you. Welcome one another willing to sacrifice themselves for you. Welcome for the Gentile. Welcome the Jewish descendant or the Jewish believer just as Christ welcomed you even when you had something to disagree on. For the Jewish believer, welcome the Gentile believer in the same way that Christ welcomed you even when you rejected him. In both instances, he's saying welcome one another with a sacrificialness that says I'll bear with you and I'll build you because we are one. Paul encourages them, and it's interesting here because Paul, he actually goes into a wishful kind of prayer that he wants them to know about. He says, may the God of, of endurance and encouragement grant you. Let me cut it up a little bit. May God grant you to live in harmony with one another. And God's qualities are that he is the God of endurance and encouragement. That means God is the God who can sustain you through this trial and he can encourage you along the way. So while you're going through the growing pains, God is encouraging you to live and function in harmony. But it's interesting because we look at that word 
harmony and we sometimes might miss it here. So I want to give you what that means. And that word harmony means to think thus. It means to dispose the mind in a certain way. And what he's saying is, Paul is saying that may the God of endurance, I'm sorry, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in, in, in such oneness of mind with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you all may with one voice glorify um, our God. That's what that's what the sense is. And what he's saying is, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Let you all function of one mind and one unity in such a way that how you think for those that were in this congregation, the Jews, and how you think those that were the Gentiles might align with the thinking of Jesus on this issue. And in doing so, may you walk in harmonious thought and and behavior, not only toward one another, but reflected out into the world in such a way that God may get the glory. And the question becomes of us. And it's ironic that we, we get to this passage because now we get here and what we come up in this, in our own church congregation is we are two years, almost two years of me being here. We are various cultures that are in one congregation and we are still learning some nuances. And God tells us, just like Paul told them, learn to embrace one another with a welcoming demeanor. Learn to look at the lens of one another through my word so that you might have the same mind walking harmoniously, but connected and, 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 and following the example or in accordance with the way Jesus sees things. So that I get the glory. I being the father gets the glory. And after he says all these things, Paul says, therefore, therefore, in light of what has just been said, therefore, in light of all of what's been said, remember in a letter, all of what's been said goes all the way back to chapter one. Therefore, in light of not um, committing certain behaviors and or approving of them and or being hypocritical in light of not being partial in light of the justification that was given on your behalf through the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ in light of the fact that we're not called to continue to live in sin in light of the fact that grace does abound but we shouldn't test it in light of the fact that we um, who have died to sin won't live in it and instead we've been resurrected in light of the fact that we have been filled with the Holy Spirit of God and therefore are now a part of his family being sealed by the Holy Spirit and connected together as children and heirs of the Father in light of the fact that salvation comes to us um, by faith I'm sorry, by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, in light of the fact that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we shall be saved in light of the fact that we are called to be different than we were by being transformed by the renewal of our minds. Um, but in light of the fact that, yes, we're subject to the authorities and that we shouldn't judge each other through the lens of the law, but through the lens of the grace that Christ gave us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And yet, as we learn not to be so critical of one another, that we also learn to be sacrificial toward one another in light of all of that and then the fact that we are to bear with one another, that we are to build one another and be welcoming to one another. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. See each other through the lens that Christ sees you. Yes, you might have flaws, but Christ loved you. This is what Paul says to this congregation. This is what I say to us. In light of all the things that we could argue about, in light of all the things that we could fuss about, and bottle, all of the differences and all of what was and what is and what will be, understand that Jesus died for all of us and he has a call, a purpose, and a, and a destination for all of us to get to. And in getting there, we're called to be of one mind, walking in unity, welcoming one another as Christ loved us. And why do we do these things? We do these things be, um, because here down in verse eight, the Bible tells us that Paul says to this congregation, for I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. God, for the Jew, Jesus came so that everything that was spoken in what we call the Old Testament, every promise made might be fulfilled so that they might know that he is God. 
And yet in verse 9, the Bible says, and. So in addition to that purpose, there was this purpose. And this purpose is that in order that the Gentiles, that's you and I, might be, might glorify God for his mercy because he chose to forgive us. Because he didn't give us what we had earned, but he gave us his son. And if it was true for them that they will, they need to function a certain way toward one another because Jesus loves them both in the same way we're called to function a certain way and live and grow and be transformed and function and demonstrate the love of God to one another and to others. Because before we learn to love one another, Christ had already decided he loved us enough. That he would come, live, teach, die, be buried and resurrected. So that you and I might be sealed by the Holy Spirit, that we might be forgiven of our sins, that we might be reconciled back to the Father. I don't know um, where you are or what you're feeling in this moment, but I want you to know this, that no matter what your background has been, no matter what you have subjected yourself to, no matter what you thought was wrong or right and functioned counter to that, I want you to know that Jesus loved you so much. Whether you consider yourself a Jew or maybe you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. They died so that God's mercy might be reflected onto you. You see, all of us needed God's mercy. Without his mercy, we have no Christ to die on our behalf. We have no Messiah to come. One who cared enough for us that even in the Old Testament, when when the tabernacle was being built and the Ark of the Covenant was being set up, there was a mercy seat. God has extended his mercy and even now is extending his mercy toward you and I. And wherever you are, wherever you're viewing this or hearing this, if you don't know him, his mercy is extended toward you. His grace is extended toward you. So that you might come in, in just like these two groups to know that he is the living God, that his word is true and his promises are fulfilled. And so that you might know that his mercy is for you because he loved you before you learned to love him. And if you're and you've never made a decision to accept that love, that love that saves you from the penalty of sin, but also gives you a Lord whose example you might follow, whose instructions will guide you to where you need to be. And you can do so right now. And I want to pray with you. And maybe you're here and you're saying, I haven't been doing these things, but now I know. Understand something that God's mercy endures forever. And in his mercy, he has his arms open for you to return. And as long as you have breath in your body, you can return to him. And for those of you who are saying, I need a church home. I want you to know something that here at Bethany Church, we will welcome you in the same way that Christ welcomed us. And I invite you to join us if you so choose. I'd love to be your pastor. And I have a, a family of believers here who would love to be connected with you as brothers and sisters in Christ. And you can do that right now. You can connect with us on any of our platforms. You can hit the connect button, hit the I want to be a member button, go to our website, do whatever it takes to get connected so that we might walk with you through this journey. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for this time that we've had together. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the love that you've shared toward us that has um, manifested itself in the death, burial, and resurrection of your only begotten son. That you loved us in spite of us and extended your arms toward us even when we at times rejected you. Lord, I pray for the person who was viewing this cast or hearing this cast or someone who's being shared this cast with that is sitting in a place of not knowing you. I pray even now that you hear their hearts, that even now that they recognize that if they would repent, that is to confess that they are sinners. And that in that confession, they also turn away from those practices, turn toward you, that they accept and believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord and that you raise them from the dead and are willing to confess that, that you, your word says that they shall be saved. I pray for the the person who is struggling in their walk and maybe even has turned away, but now wants to return to you. I pray now that you might receive them with open arms. Let them know that they are loved by you. And Lord, I pray for the person who is seeking or in need of a family, a community and a church that can help walk alongside them so they might become 
transformed into the likeness of your son. I pray that they might either be connected to us as we desire to be connected to them, or that you might steer their ship to where they are to grow and be discipled so they become more like you. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Spirit of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest rule and abide with you so that until we meet again and until we greet again, you might know that you are welcomed and loved by our Lord. God bless you all. See you next week.